Hello everyone and welcome to The Wild Side. That was Muse with Survival, which you might remember was the theme song of last year's Olympics. And I have played that song to kick us off for another episode of talking about mammals, which is also the topic of last week's show. And this time around, instead of kind of giving you an overview of what mammals are out there and what characteristics they have and kind of the evolutionary process of becoming uh, the mammalian group that we are. I want to talk about some of the specific characteristics that mammals have that help them to survive. So some of the adaptations that they have to help them um, kind of stay warm enough and get enough food and water and move around in the habitat and do all of the interesting behaviors that we see them do, um, which I think is one of the big reasons why we find mammals to be so appealing and so interesting is because they do have a lot of really interesting characteristics and um, behaviors as well. Now I should mention that I was thinking about last week's show as I was walking here this morning and it occurred to me that I might have made a few mistakes in terms of some of the facts that I gave you and I I'm not entirely sure I don't quite remember so I want to apologize if I did misspeak. I have to say that I had a bit of a migraine and I was on some pain medication that might have made me a bit fuzzy so this morning I will try to, well this afternoon, I will try to concentrate really hard and make sure I don't spread any misinformation this time around. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about mammal survival and kind of the basics of mammal survival. And one of the most important things that not just mammals, but actually all animals need to do is to stay warm enough so that they don't freeze to death, but also to make sure that they stay cool enough so that they don't overheat. So there's this really important balance that animals have to make um, and have to keep so that they don't start going into any kind of uh, shock or overload and then have their system start to shut down. So mammals are something called endotherms. And that means that we can generate our own heat and then try to keep it within an optimal range. And that optimal range, um, that, that, sorry, that keeping it at an optimal range is called homeothermy. So it's kind of guarding that temperature and making sure that it stays within a certain set of comfortable boundaries within which you function in a normal way. So different groups and different species of mammals have different average body temperatures. Um, so for example, something that's really small like a mouse uh, would probably have a very different average body temperature than something quite large or something aquatic like uh, an elephant or a, a whale, for example. And another thing that we do know is that uh, not just is there this among species difference, but it also kind of depends on what lineage you come from. So monotremes, for instance, tend to have very low body temperatures. They're much closer to those reptilian ancestors in terms of the, the traits that they have, and so they are more likely uh, to have those kind of reptilian traits of being a bit cooler. Uh, and things like armadillos and sloths and anteaters also have quite low temperatures. And these are things that often don't come by their food on a regular basis. They might go for a while in between eating. They can have really slow digestion, and so the whole body just kind of slows down. The metabolism is really low, and as a result, they have this kind of very low body temperature that, that they keep themselves at, and that's quite healthy for them, but maybe wouldn't be so great if you measured the same thing in a species like us. So having this kind of autonomy of being able to produce our own heat is really useful because it does mean that we can go out uh, not just during the day when it's warm, but also at night. And this is something that obviously distinguishes us quite a bit from some of the reptiles. Um, so we know that there are lots of snakes that will come out uh, in the first thing in the morning and in, in, in spring after they've come out of hibernation. And they'll start to warm up on the rocks and they'll start to use that heat to then move around. But then at the end of the day, they have to go find a little spot and hide away again. And that's not something that we necessarily have to do. We can function at all times of the day. We can also go out during the winter, we can also go out in the cold climates. So there are all sorts of boundaries that we're able to kind of cross because we do have this capacity to keep ourselves warm in environments or at times where it would actually be quite cold if we were the same temperature as the area around us. Now unfortunately this does mean, well fortunately and unfortunately, uh, that we're remaining constantly active and that means that even at a cellular level things are always continuing because there always has to be something going on to create this energy that we use to keep us warm. And that's great because, uh, you know, in one way it does mean that we're always doing things and we're always able to keep our bodies active and, 
and doing all the other things, not just temperature generation, that kind of keep us alive and keep the various systems functioning. But that also means that there is a really heavy price to pay. So there is quite a high energy demand. And if you look at mammals uh, compared to reptiles of similar sizes, we will often be burning five to ten times as much energy as they are. And in fact, um, 80 to 90 percent of all of our energy is spent on thermoregulation. So that is a huge amount of uh, input that we need to make in order to keep ourselves up to this level, to keep our system going. And the different energetic demands that each species have um, will be influenced by a lot of things. So body size, body shape, amount of insulation, so whether you have blubber or not, whether you have fur or not. The ambient temperature, of course, if it's already really warm outside, you probably don't need to expend too much energy warming yourself back up. Now, smaller animals in general do tend to have higher energy requirements. They have very fast metabolism. If you've ever picked up something like a mouse or maybe a little hamster or gerbil and felt its heartbeat uh, while you held it in your hand, you'll probably have noticed that its heart is beating extremely fast. And you often will notice how very warm they are. Um, that's one of the reasons why the animals are so snuggly, why we like to have our cats and dogs with us in bed, because they can keep us very warm. Uh, with all that heat that they're producing. But this is at quite a high cost for them, so they're metabolizing all the time, and as a result, they're always having to eat as well in order to fuel that. And of course, uh, on the other end of that spectrum, larger animals have lower energy requirements and slower metabolism um, to go along with that. But what's interesting is that even within species, not just across different species, you find that there can be quite a lot of variation. So if you take a species, for example, that lives in both hot and cold climates, you can find massive differentiation uh, in the metabolic rate that you tend to see, the basal metabolic rate. So kind of whenever it's not uh, extending itself too much, it's just hanging around maintaining basic body functions. You can find that um, something like a coyote, for example, which has a really large range in uh, the U.S., if you look at where it's living, well, not just the U.S., I should say, also throughout North America. So if you go all the way up to the northernmost bit of its range uh, in the Arctic, and you look also all the way down towards the southernmost bit of its range, which is kind of in a deserty type area in the southwest, or even stretching into Mexico, you can find that these things have about a 40% difference in basal metabolic rate. So each animal can really have quite a range uh, and really respond to its environment appropriately in order to maintain a life in that habitat. And one other thing to mention is that each animal will also have what's called a thermoneutral zone. And this is a, the kind of range of temperatures in which we aren't too cold and needing to produce heat to stay warm, but also where we aren't too hot and needing to do something to get rid of that excess heat, like panting or sweating or whatever. And so uh, all of us will kind of strive to live in that zone, whether that means we'll migrate at certain times of year or we'll engage in certain behaviors to keep our bodies within that area, because that is um, the temperature range in which we function best and uh, we're not burning any excess energy that we could use in other ways instead. Now I've mentioned several times now the fact that all of this energy associated with thermoregulation has to come from somewhere, and that somewhere is metabolism. And, and one of the things that we need to metabolize, so there are lots of, metabolism refers to a whole process in general, kind of chemical process, and you can metabolize uh, different things to come up with different products. But one of the ways that we can use this word is when we're thinking about food. So we can break down food and extract energy from that. And mammals have some really interesting and diverse feeding practices. So early mammals, like uh, the reptiles that they were descending from, were predatory and they were insectivorous. And there are, in fact, still lots of mammals that are insectivorous. I already mentioned a couple today, so things like armadillos and anteaters. Um, but there are also lots of other things. So frugivores that eat fruit, nectivores that like nectar, herbivores that eat things like grasses, Carnivores, of course, eat meat. Sanguinivores, so there are um, vampire bats, for example, that feed on blood. Piscivores, which will eat um, fish. And omnivores, which we are, uh, most of us anyway, naturally we would be in an omnivorous state, which eat pretty much anything they come across. And they tend to be quite generalistic and opportunistic as well. And all of this variation is made possible by something called adaptive radiation. And adaptive radiation is basically the emergence of new characteristics um, because you're able to, uh, suddenly you have some sort of 
of maybe a release on all of the evolutionary pressure, so maybe some other animals died off or a new habitat opens up or something happens so that there is a niche that is available to be filled. And so uh, animals like mammals, this can happen with any organism really, but an animal like the mammal would be able to take advantage of that new niche um, and perhaps the only way to do that would be to use a new characteristic to develop something new. Uh, so mammals that were able to kind of get in there preliminarily and take advantage of that situation, they would eventually evolve, in, evolve into these things that had really good adaptations for living in that same niche. And of course, that would take quite a lot of time because it takes a lot of breeding and a lot of natural selection for those really good traits to be selected um, and the bad traits to be weeded out. But this is something that did happen over millions of years, so we have suddenly all of these different types of mammals that specialize in all sorts of different ways and are able to extract things from the habitat. And this is something that actually, a process that has driven lots of different um, variations that we see. So it's not just in feeding hab habits, but also in um, plumage patterns, for example, or uh, breeding behaviors, or all sorts of things like that. I'm just mentioning it now because there is such an amazing diversity of, of feeding habits and this is something that's such an essential part of an animal's uh, life history that of course it can be something that really helps drive adaptive radiation. Now one of the big things that you can see that really varies among animals, uh, mammals that have different types of feeding techniques are the types of teeth that they have and teeth are a really good indicator of what an animal's diet is and in fact People who do um, archaeology and also paleontology are able to look at the teeth that they have unearthed and, and determine the diet of the people or the animals um, to whom those teeth originally belonged. And this is something that you can do, uh, interestingly, with human skulls, which is why I mentioned archaeology. So people in different regions would have eaten different things, and at different time periods they were taking advantage of different food sources. So you can look at this also in people as well as in animals. And when you're looking at mammals, one of the things you can find is those kind of early um, ancestral types of insect eating teeth. And these teeth tend to be shaped like cones or blades, and they're really good at crushing and piercing those hard shells uh, that often encase a lot of insects, especially the insects that tend to be big enough to have all the energy that these animals want. So those are the animals that, that tend to be targeted the most. Um, interestingly though, ant and termite eaters, and of course ants and termites are also bugs, but um, these guys will tend to have very few teeth at all, and that's because they're using their long tongues to slurp up the ants, and so they don't really need the teeth um, to grind or to capture anything. They can just use their tongue to lick up what they need and then suck it straight down, so teeth are kind of superfluous. In something like a sanguinivorous bat, so the vampire bats, you need to have those piercing canines. Um, that, of course, you'll, you'll know already if you've ever seen a vampire movie uh, or any picture of a vampire. So basically that is what the mouths of these bats look like. They have those little canines that kind of um, stick out like little fangs, and they use those to puncture uh, the animals that they're feeding off of and then suck out the blood. And then things that are um, interested in eating uh, herbivorous sorts of things, so grasses and leaves and even stems and things like that, as you might expect, those sorts of animals need really broad and flat teeth that are able to grind down and reduce that cellulose because cellulose tends to be really tough. If you've ever had to go cut um, maybe a, a green stem for some reason, you're trying to prune back a tree and you don't have the proper tools, you know that it can take forever to get that to come off of the plant because it's really bendy, it's really pliant, it tends to um, just really want to, to stay in place. And that's the kind of thing that these animals are, are dealing with when they're trying to cut through them uh, in order to chew them up and, and suck them down. And then of course when you're thinking about the animals that are interested in eating meat, you have to have teeth that are able to potentially grab onto a prey item to squeeze really hard and crush it to death or suffocate it or whatever the case might be depending on your hunting technique. You also need teeth that are capable of ripping into that animal and pulling out the meat and then additional teeth that are good at kind of um, bludgeoning it down so it's small enough into little bits and pieces to swallow. And you know if you have a cat or a dog you've probably watched them eat at some point. Uh, especially cats you'll notice that they tend to be kind of awkward with how they eat things and they'll kind of chew with their mouth open and just gnaw at something and it takes them a while to get pieces down. And that's because really their mouths are adapted to kill the prey but not necessarily chew it up 
uh, and kind of get that meat down to a little, a nice little bit the way that we can do with our crushing teeth. Um, they just mostly have those sharp teeth uh, to grab onto something and suffocate it to death. So the, the teeth that you have have to be adapted for certain tasks, but they may not be good for all tasks, and it's really all about balancing the different needs that you have to get the energy that you need out of whatever it is that you're eating. Now associated with the different types of teeth, there are, often, there are also different types of musculature, and I mentioned in last week's show that we do have this uh, specialized musculature in mammals uh, especially in mammals that are carnivorous, where we have this kind of ridge on the top of our skull and we have these really strong muscles associated with um, the, the skull and the jaw area that allow us to move this jaw that we have that is something that distinguishes us quite a bit from the reptiles. And particular mammals have um, very, very strong musculature because of the things that they do with their jaws. So, for example, I've mentioned already the fact that we do have these uh, predatory animals, so things like lions, that will hunt by grabbing onto something and just crushing its windpipe. And they'll just hang on until it can no longer breathe and then ends up dying that way. So they're not actually using those big fangs and paws uh, to really rip something apart. They kill it by suffocating it, basically. And so they have to have extremely powerful jaws. And you can see, when you look at their, their skull, they do have that sagittal crest, that pronounced sagittal crest to which all of those jaw muscles are attached. And this is what allows them to close on to that prey and then not let go until the job is done. And that's not something that you see to that extent in all mammals. It really is going to depend. Uh, in association with that, you also have to have um, sometimes some gripping mechanisms elsewhere in the body, not just in the mouth. So if you think about animals that are um, preying on something that they grab with their feet, for example, whether it's uh, a lion, again, with the claws that they might need to swat down something, or if you've ever seen those pictures of cheetahs that go hunting together, and you'll often have a couple that will grab onto something together and bring it down. Um, so things like that would need claws for that reason. And as I mentioned earlier, those claws can have, or as I'll mention later, sorry, those claws can have other purposes, but they are quite good for gripping onto prey. You might also have a thing uh, like what you see in the piscivorous bats, where you've got these bats flying along and they need to pick up something as they swoop past and, and then they're going to carry it off and eat it elsewhere. And so these guys often have gripping mechanisms in their feet. Uh, so rather than in their jaws, they have it in their feet to pick up their prey that way. Another really important thing associated with all the feeding is going to be then how you process that feeding. So it's not just about getting the food to begin with, it's about extracting the actual nutrients from that food. And so we tend to have different types of gut that are specialized to the type of food that we stick in there and the types of things that we need to get out of it. So ruminants, you'll probably be familiar with ruminants because we have a lot of them in our lives, a lot of cows and things like that that we have living up in close proximity. So we know their feeding habits pretty well. You'll, you'll have seen these guys uh, chewing on a cud and taking forever to digest their food and they'll just gnaw on grass all day long because uh, you, you do need to have a lot of it and it does take them quite a long time to digest everything. So you'll probably be kind of familiar with this process. Animals like that will have really large intestines because they need to maximize the amount of time they have for digestion. So they have really long digestive tracts so that the food takes forever to pass through it and that gives the body time to break everything down and extract all the nutrients that the animals need. And a lot of animals, uh, well probably all of them actually, will have symbiotic bacteria that can perform some amount of um, digestion. So ruminants actually have special types of bacteria that are that kind of go above and beyond, uh, oops, sorry, above and beyond the ones that we have, because uh, they can actually perform fermentation, and it's a pretty hardcore process where it's really a lot of action going on, and they have to have those bacteria. Now we also have ones that help with digestion, but if something happens to our gut flora, we can um, continue to digest. But these other guys because cellulose is so hard to break down and it takes forever to get stuff out of it, they might actually not survive without their bacteria. And certain types of uh, these cows and things that eat these herbivorous food items, they will ha actually have little pouches of bacteria in which they'll store, um, they'll store the bacteria in their stomach and that protects them from the other acids in the environment and it keeps these bacteria safe so that they can do this process and not get wiped out by the rest of the digestion within the cow's guts. And one last thing I want to mention about feeding, this before moving on to kind of another topic, is the social systems and the other behaviors that kind of go along with the whole process of eating. So in some species of animals, we get 
these mammals working together in order to bring down uh, whatever sort of prey there is. So for example, there are lots of animals that hunt in packs. I've already mentioned lions, but other examples are um, like wolves and other canid species will do this as well. Dolphins will often hunt in packs or in pods in that case. We've got animals that will share tools. So this is something that we don't just see in humans, but also things like chimps mm -hmm. will share tools with each other. Tool use has also been observed in other animals. So uh, orangutans, for example, have been seen to use sticks as tools. And there are lots of species where the adults will actively teach the juveniles how to forage. And that's a very social behavior, of course, because you have to actively teach the young. And now there are lots of species where the young will watch the adults and kind of learn that way. But there are several species like um, meerkats are a really good example where you've got the adults that are teaching the young how to catch and handle mm -hmm. and eat their prey items and if the young don't have that guidance they probably wouldn't be able to go on uh, and live on their own uh, and kind of do things for themselves once they're adults. Mm -hmm. Other interesting behaviors we see are caching and hoarding and this is when the animals will set aside food when times are good so that they'll have something when times get hard and this is the reason that we see things like chipmunks and squirrels and mice running around with um, giant cheekfuls full of food. And I actually saw quite a lot of this this summer when I was home uh, in the U.S. visiting my family. My parents have a, a couple of chipmunks that live near their deck, and the chipmunks would just spend all day running back and forth with these gigantic mouthfuls of nuts or whatever it was that they were eating. And I have no idea where they were going, but wherever the destination was, there must have been quite a massive hoard of food left over. And rats will do this as well, and often one of the reasons that people know they have a rat infestation is that they see uh, these weird piles of dog food or of pasta from the kitchen cabinet or whatever it is that the rats will have stored somewhere really weird, like someone's shoe or in the corner of a, um, a bookshelf or something. So there are lots of, of animals that will do this, so that they always have food no matter what the environmental conditions are. And Finally, the one last thing I want to mention, which I've already kind of alluded to, is the fact that depending on the nutrient content of food, mammals may need to eat all of the time or they may be able to go really long periods in between meals. So sometimes we'll have animals that can go several days or they can even hibernate all the way through the winter without having to eat anything because they can rely on what they've eaten before. And that's especially true if they're able to put on a lot of fat and just go through their own food reserves over the winter. So not all animals actually need to eat every day. And some animals have to eat all the way through the day, pretty much from the time they get up to the time they go to sleep. Uh, so this can really have a huge impact on the behavior that we see in these animals. Welcome back to the Wild Side. That was Joan as policewoman singing Feed the Light. And today we are on part two of a series on mammals. And I think there probably will be a part three because I'm sure I won't get through everything I was thinking of saying today and there are lots of other things I could add on to that as well. So I hope that you are interested in finding out more about this wonderful group of species to which we belong. And the next thing I wanted to talk about today, having already gone through um, kind of basic energetic requirements and the act of feeding is mammal structure and movement. And structure and movement uh, is interesting because it kind of tells us a lot about, uh, well, the two things go together. If we look at structure, we can figure out a lot about how these animals are moving. And when we know how they're moving, we can kind of think about what sorts of habitats they probably are living in and what sorts of behaviors they're engaging in. So actually these basic morphological characteristics uh, if we know a little bit about that, we can actually glean a lot of information about an animal uh, if we look at a picture of it or see its skeleton somewhere. So if you get some of these basics under your belt, then next time you go to a museum, you'll know a lot more about things whenever you see them without even having to uh, read the little plaques on the wall. Or the next time you go to a zoo, for example, you'll really kind of understand what you're looking at more. So thinking about mammal skeletons, there are really two types of skeletal features that we can focus on. And the first are axial features, and these are things that involve all the bones that are associated with the central portion of the skeleton, the axis, the main axis of the body. So that's things like the skull and the vertebrae and the ribs and the sternum. And then everything else is the appendicular skeleton, and that's all the other bones, so things like the girdles and the limbs and the hands and the feet, all the extremities that are attached 
to that central bit of the body. And we do tend to see lots of similarities across all mammals. That's kind of inevitable because you do have uh, the process of evolution. So we all come from this distant ancestor and have evolved from that. So of course there are going to be things that we share. But there are also lots of variations that are associated with the fact that we have specialized. There have been many, many years uh, in between now and the time that we did evolve from that common ancestor. We live in different types of habitats and eat different types of food and all that sort of thing. And so that has driven lots of changes. So for example, just to name a couple, most mammals tend to have seven cervical vertebrae. And those are the vertebrae that are right under the skull, kind of in the neck area. But sloths only have six of those. Uh, if you look at most mammals, they tend to have 12 pairs of ribs, but whales only have nine. So there are little things like that uh, that will change over time because animals maybe aren't using certain things and so they can kind of just disappear, or there might actually be active selection against something or active selection for something else that might replace it. And so you do tend to have these changes appearing over time. Now, as I mentioned, the basic kind of body plan of an animal is really going to um, be driven by the sorts of movements that it needs to make to get through its habitat and to evade predators and to impress uh, potential mates and to grab the food items that it needs and to, to survive in that basic environment that it lives in. So we tend to see lots of different locomotion styles evolving in mammals to allow them to navigate through the environment and do all the things that they need to do. Walking and running are a really obvious one. I mean, we do those things very well. Jumping and ricocheting. Uh, climbing and, and swinging, I've written down here swining, that's not exactly what I meant. Um, I suppose you could think of what pigs do and give that a verb form. Uh, burrowing is another example, and also gliding and flying. We often tend to forget about the fact there are mammals that are able to fly, and of course those are bats. So let's just think about each one of these in turn. So walking and running. Now if you've listened to the show in the past, you'll know I've, I've done some um, discussion before about walking and about uh, kind of human athletics. and There are a lot of people that think that many of the characteristics that we humans have uh, have evolved because of the fact that we uh, needed to walk and we in fact needed to run in order to chase down uh, the prey items that we were interested in. And so not just the kind of basic body plan of humans but also a lot of the other characteristics that you see uh, on us, so our hairlessness for example, have evolved in association with this type of of movement, but we are hardly the only ones that walk or run. And the movements of walking and running can cover a huge spectrum that range from really slow movements to very, very fast movements. So things like cheetahs, which I've also talked about in the past, um, that can get up to probably 100 miles per hour or even more when they're out running across the savanna. Now associated with these different speeds um, and kind of different body plans, there are a lot of terms that help us kind of think about the, the grouping of characteristics and the grouping of movements that go along with those. And the first of these is graviportal. So an animal that is graviportal is going to be very slow, probably pretty awkward when it's moving on land. It doesn't move much or cover much distance whenever it does move and jumping is going to be extremely rare or impossible. And in these animals, what you're mostly going to see is kind of adaptations that allow that animal to carry a lot of weight because these tend to be things that are really big and they just aren't going to be you know, sprinting around. So a really good example of that is a hippo. The next stage up from that, going kind of towards the fast end of the spectrum, is metaportal or mediportal. And these are things that are still going to be pretty slow relative to some other species, but they spend a lot more time moving around. So they have to be able to move, they just aren't going to do it uh, extremely fast although sometimes they might need to move quickly and so they are capable of doing that if they need to maybe run at something that they feel is potentially threatening it. And examples of that include bison and elephants and things like the rhinoceros. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, if you're lucky enough to have been to Africa, which I have a couple of times now, uh, you'll note that if you see these animals, most of the time they are just kind of standing around eating some food. They might wander between food patches and when you see them do that, they're not going very fast, they're not racing there, but there are times when they feel threatened and all of a sudden they will bolt. And it's amazing how fast these animals can move quite quickly. But they usually don't do that for very long, they don't go very far, and they still have these adaptations to help them carry that amazing body weight that they have. So those gigantic thick legs and elephants, for example. The next stage up from that is subcursorial. 
And these are uh, species that have limbs that are not really modified to bear weight in the way that those elephants are, but they're also not um, quite the fastest things. They're kind of somewhere in the middle. They're kind of an average runner. And th these are going to be things like buffalo, where they're pretty good at moving um, pretty quickly over pretty good distances, but they're not really specialized to either end of the spectrum. And the far end of that, the, the really fastest animals, those are going to be cursorial animals. And they are adapted specifically to run. And they're good at long distance running and at high speeds. And these are not the animals that do um, high acceleration over short distances. So there are lots of animals that can do that when they need to. But these are things that are really designed to actually run for a long time. So things like horses and cheetahs and wolves and species like that. And the requirements of being able to walk and to run are that you need to have support and stability. And this really means that you have to have an appropriate posture. So you can think of lots of postures that wouldn't be very well adapted to run. So something like a, a bat, for example, just doesn't quite have the physique and the posture to be able to navigate for very long uh, overground on its feet. And if you're looking at support and stability, there are some, some further distinctions you can make to think about what type of posture an animal has. And the first of these is plantigrade. So something that's plantigrade is putting its palms down onto the ground so that the soles are having contact with the ground. And this is what we see in humans. Uh, you've got the next phase, which is a really hard word for me to say, so bear with me here, um, digitigrade, which means that your, your digits, your uh, phalanges, your toes, are contacting the ground. So you're kind of walking up uh, on your fingers, basically, or on your toes. And you can kind of imagine this um, by thinking about birds. So I mentioned this term before when I was talking about flamingos. So a lot of birds will walk in this posture. We also see it in dogs and in cats. So next time you see a dog, you'll notice that it is kind of walking up a little bit on the pads of its feet and it's not resting its foot all the way down on the ground. That's why you have that funny little kind of um, angle on its leg. Uh, and that's because it is walking kind of up on its toes. And then you've got something that you only see in animals with hooves, and that's called unguligrade. And these guys have these elevated toes, basically, because they've got the hooves. So it would be kind of like if we're walking on not just the toes, but on the very tips of our toes. And that's what we see in these ungulates. Now the next important thing to think about is propulsion. And propulsion is basically the, the energy that we put into moving ourselves forward. And this is achieved by the movement of joints and muscles and ligaments and tendons. And all of these things together work to form levers and springs so that we can take all of that energy and actually put it into forward movement or upward movement or whatever direction that we're going. But you wind all that energy up into these springy, powerful things and then let it loose and that is what's going to propel us forward over space. Another thing that's important is maneuverability. So a lot of animals do only need to just go straight forward. So maybe something like a buffalo or an elephant, you know, it's out in a really open habitat. It's going to see everything coming towards it. There aren't any surprises. There's not a whole lot in the way. So they can just go straight ahead. But there are also lots of other animals that will need to be able to move around and zigzag. They have to go around trees or maybe they're chasing something that can change direction at any moment and they have to be able to grab onto it. So it's really important for these animals to be able to move around really quickly and change direction. And there are lots of things that can facilitate this, but a couple are um, having retractable claws, for example. So in cats, they can get their claws up out of the ground so that it doesn't accidentally cause them to dig in, or they can use them to dig in if they need to so they can kind of adjust direction a little bit. Things with the tail can use their tail to facilitate balance. So if they suddenly have to switch uh, to one side, they can throw their tail up to help them do that or to help them correct so that they don't switch too fast and fall over to that side. So little features like this can ensure that not only are you moving, but you're moving with finesse and you're moving with kind of um, the, in the direction that you want to go at the drop of the hat. And finally, the last really important thing is endurance. And this is something that has been uh, really an interesting thing to study in people, as I've mentioned before on the show, because it does seem to be that humans have evolved to be endurance runners, and we were able to evolve to 
out endure the species that we were chasing down on the savanna. And there have been all sorts of uh, interesting recent studies about the effects that this has had on our physiology uh, and the way that this kind of gave us an advantage. And lots of other animals also have to have really high endurance. And all of us share the need to have efficient respiration, so we need to get a lot of oxygen to our muscles and we need to get it there quickly. Because you all know what happens if you don't get enough oxygen. If, you know, if you've ever started off running after not doing it for a while or you're just starting out, you know how painful it is because you just don't have kind of the lung capacity to get that oxygen to yourself and you're getting really tired, everything's burning, it's awful. And so these animals have to uh, be very efficient at respiring all the time so that they're always able to fuel these movements. And they also need to have really good heat loss. Um, because, of course, it's going to be very warm if you're, you're moving and your muscles are generating all this heat and you can overheat very quickly. And that's true even in environments that aren't extremely warm. In places that are warm, that's going to be even worse. And so you have to come up with some mode of getting rid of that heat loss. Uh, sorry, of getting rid of that heat. So whether that's losing all of your fur so that you're always uh, exposed to the the air and you're getting a breeze, whether that's producing sweat, whether that's panting, whatever the case is, you need to be able to get rid of that heat so that your body doesn't overload um, and pay the price of all of this movement that you are trying to engage in. And that was Dido with Let Us Move On and you are listening to The Wild Side on Source FM and today I am talking about mammals, uh, which is a continuation of a series that I'm doing on mammals. And before the break I was talking about mammals that walk and run and the, the adaptations that they need for that process. And now I want to kind of more quickly go through some of the other things that we see. So another type of movement that is uh, not uncommon is jumping and ricocheting. And these animals are often known also as being saltatorial animals. So things like uh, kangaroos or rabbits, for example. And jumping, of course, involves all four limbs, uh, as you see in rabbits, but it can also involve only two limbs, as you see in kangaroos. And so uh, there are going to be different suites of characteristics that you see, depending on what sort of jumping these animals are going to engage in. And both jumping and ricocheting often involve having kind of some of the, some of the similar things, but it's just going to be kind of slightly uh, modified depending on whether you're jumping or ricocheting. So you're probably going to have large hind limbs and very large back feet. You probably are also going to have a, a shifting in your center of gravity and it's going to be towards the rear, but exactly how far towards the rear and, and where exactly it is will differ depending on whether you're a kangaroo type mover or a rabbit type mover. A lot of these anim animals will often have long, thick and or muscular tails. So uh, if you think about uh, little mice, for example, little kangaroo mice, uh, and kangaroo rats, they'll tend to have really long tails that will kind of go straight out behind them and those can help them kind of navigate and, and do the kind of balance sort of thing as they're jumping around. But things like kangaroos that are sitting up on their hind feet will use their tails to kind of anchor them and help them sit upright and not fall over. So that tail is going to be slightly different, much more muscular uh, than the one you see in the little rodents. You also, you also can often find things like skin folds under the armpits. So we see this in sifakas. Uh, and skin folds are found in animals that tend to glide, so this is called the patagium. But we also see it in some of the, the ricocheting and the jumping animals because this skin fold can help them kind of stay up in the air and glide around and make the most of their height w while they have it. So there are lots of kind of interesting things that can work together to help these animals bounce around in the way that they do. Now climbing, uh, or arboreal movement, is something that is that, that comes in our ancestry. So we do descend from animals uh, that did a lot of climbing, which is one of the reasons that we have the, the hands and the arms that we have now. So obviously we aren't quite as much into that these days as we used to. We don't have really long arms the way that a lot of monkeys and other primates will have. But we do still have basically what I would call the number one thing that climbing animals need to have, which is really strong and flexible hands that are able to grasp. And you see in animals that climb the development of opposable or partially opposable thumbs to facilitate gripping. You know, these, these are tools that we use in order to hold on to branches to, to manipulate 
uh, our bodies as they go flying through the treetops. And so this is a really important thing because if your grasp doesn't work, then you aren't going to make it very long, probably because you're going to fall or you're not going to be able to latch on. And so this is a really important tra trait to have. And assisting with that process of grabbing onto things are things like claws, which can help you anchor your feet, uh, rough foot pads that can increase the friction and also kind of help with the anchoring and sticking onto a tree trunk or a branch. A lot of species will have tails um, that can be used for gripping and for balance. And the tails that are able to actively do this on their own and kind of be really um, manipulable, if you like, and they're able to do quite a lot of movement are known as prehensile. So these tails that are able to act completely independently from the body and, and you latch onto the tree and help an animal so that it doesn't fall off or help it reach something really far away. And animals that are climbing animals tend to have a body plan that's quite long with strong arms and rotary cup joints that allow you to engage in a swinging movement. So if you think about uh, those species that you might see at a zoo, so for example the colobus that will kind of swing um, from one tree branch to the next and, and move itself through, they'll often be hanging, or a, gib a gibbon's another great example, they'll be hanging um, from a branch with both arms and they'll just kind of swing from one place to another. And being able to have that rotary cut movement means you don't have to do lots of little stages, you can just kind of do one big smooth motion of movement forward. And these guys actually are very fast. They can reach speeds up to like 50 miles per hour when they're doing this kind of movement. So it is quite efficient. Another type of animal, kind of at the other extreme, is the burrowing animals. So these guys are also known as being fossorial or subterranean. So living kind of on the ground or underneath the ground. And they tend to have really short, powerful limbs because they need to be able to dig through often very uh, hard ground, so they have to be quite strong. And the best way to have strength is not to have all that extra limb space, but to have it really close to the body so you can really anchor it in and get a lot of movement uh, of the earth that you're trying to dig up. They also will have large and spade-shaped front paws so they can move a lot of earth at once. If you think about a, a mole, maybe you've seen a mole at some point, some of those have enormous paws that are um, you know, the size of their head. It's incredible. You can't imagine what that would look like in a human. But in those guys, it's really useful because it can shovel quite a lot of earth which, with each swipe. And a lot of these guys will lose their vision if they're spending a lot of time under the ground. It's completely pointless to be able to see well because there's almost no light. And so they will lose their vision. They'll have um, just vestigial eyes that are there but not really functioning uh, to gain any sort of sense of the environment. But they will then gain tactile sense. So these guys are very good at maybe feeling vibrations or at feeling um, using lots of fur in order to feel what's happening in the earth around them. So they can feel a lot of stuff and kind of create their vision of the world in that way rather than actually seeing it. And some of these will also have adapted dentition for the digging. So their teeth are specifically adapted to help them dig through the ground. And it's incredible, the pictures, if you look online, some of these things have massive teeth that they're using to gnaw their way through the earth or maybe gnaw their way through a vine that might get in the way or something. So there are lots of tools that they use together to help them to navigate through soil that's often quite packed. And they can do it very quickly as well because some of these species will need to dig themselves out a burrow, not just to stay there for a long time, but to run away from a predator and to stay safe at the drop of a hat. So they have to be able to do this very efficiently. Uh, and so they do have quite a lot of strength that they can muster at any given point. Now, there are a couple other types of movement that I'd like to talk about, but I think I will save that for next week because I'm beginning to run out of time and I don't want to speed through them. I want to give them justice. So I will save that for the future. So we'll have part three of the mammal series next week. And for now, I will leave you with, very appropriately, Tom Petty singing Time to Move On. <laughs>